Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another free monthly webinar from Smith School of Business. My name is Meredith Dalt. I'm gonna, I know that people are trickling into our webinar this morning, so I'm gonna let people keep joining, but I'm gonna go over some of our housekeeping stuff before we get going with the meat of today's presentation, which is what you need to know about digital transformation. And speaking of digital transformation, we do have some really exciting news on the topic, which we are going to be sharing at the end of today's webinar. So I will encourage you to stay tuned right to the end today to hear something pretty great. Um, as always, today's webinar is presented by Smith Business Insight and by Queen's Executive Education. Um, our presentation will be recorded as it always is. A lot of you ask if you can have the slides, if you can have the transcript. Please rest assured you will be receiving a copy of this presentation in your inbox in a couple of days. So just stay tuned for that. It's coming. If you want to ask a question, and I hope you will, we'll be getting to questions at this in the second part of today's presentation. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So not the chat button. Please use the Q&A button and we'll get to those questions as they come in in the second part of today's presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel today. I'm going to start with Dr. Elspeth Murray, who is an associate professor and the associate dean of the MBA and master's programs at Smith School of Business. She's also the, the director of the Center for Business Venturing and the CIBC faculty fellow in entrepreneurship at Smith. Dr. Murray is an expert in strategy, the management of change, and entrepreneurship, and the co-author of the best-selling book, Fast Forward, Organizational Change in 100 Days with Peter Richardson. She also advises tech companies and is working on a number of digital transformation projects focused on creating an analytics culture. Dr. Catherine Broman is an associate professor and distinguished faculty fellow of management information systems at Smith School of Business. She is an expert in the areas of digital transformation and strategy execution. She, also, she has also co-authored several books, including Shift, A New Mindset for Sustainable Execution. Dr. Broman has also pioneered programs in strategy execution and digital transformation across MBA and executive education programs. And Tolu Arogunmati is a product manager at Sportsnet, where he leads all mobile apps. In his role, he oversees digital thinking centered on increasing sports fandom through mobile devices. Prior to his role at Sportsnet, Tolu led multiple digital product experiences at IBM in its financial planning and performance analytics division. He also holds an MBA from Smith School of Business. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to the panel today. Thank you so much for joining us. Can everybody, is everybody unmuted? Good. Okay. We're going to start today by getting everybody on the same page. So we've got a quick video, which are gonna, it's gonna help our audience understand some of the key areas and the terms that we're gonna be band bandying around today when we talk about digital transformation. So let's watch that video and then get to our presentations. 87% of senior business leaders say that digitalization is a company priority, but only 40% believe they've succeeded. The world is going digital. Organizations must go all in on digital to compete and win with customers over the coming decade. To do this, business leaders need to embrace digital transformation and understand what it takes to lead their organizations through it. Making sense of terms such as digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation is the first step in understanding the benefits of digital transformation and how to get there. Digitization is the process of changing information from analog to digital form. For example, taking paper files and turning them into digital files is a form of digitization. Digitization is a prerequisite for digital transformation. Unlike digitization, digitalization doesn't have a single definition. But for our purposes, we will adopt the following. Digitalization is the playbook that guides an organization through digital transformation. It establishes a robust digital strategy, assigns effective leadership, leverages the right technology, navigates through organizational barriers, and changes the way a business delivers value to its customers, employees, partners, and other stakeholders. Digital transformation is deep-rooted organizational change that aligns a corporate strategy to changing industry dynamics inherent in the digital age. 
digital transformation is essential for winning in the digital age. Leaders across all industries are working to leverage digital technology to transform the way their products and services deliver value to customers. Don't get left behind. All right, I'm now gonna turn things over to Dr. Murray for our first presentation, and then we're gonna go into the next and the next, and then open the floor up to questions. So get those questions posted in Q&A as they come to you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Meredith, for as always so capably uh, kicking us off. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this uh, time uh, together for a while because it's not that often that I get to hang out with uh, former students and uh, one of my most awesome colleagues, Dr. Catherine Broman. I'm going to kick things off and uh, the game plan we have today is uh, you're going to hear from me for about 10 minutes or so, Catherine and then Tolu. So let us get right into it. Um, you know, digital transformation, um, digitization, digitalization, um, problem number one, uh, once the definitions are understood, is that when we talk about digital, um, it is not a strategy or an afterthought. These days, it is the strategy. So let's unpack what we mean by this thing called strategy. And as a reminder for everyone, um, and there are many definitions of this term, but at its core, strategy really encapsulates the choices that an organization makes around its business model, what is going to drive success. But also, equally important, is sort of the sequencing of moves. So if you buy the argument that it's not about a digital strategy, it's about strategy that incorporates digital we're really talking about examining the foundation of organizations' business models, you know, where you will play. Um, digital allows an enormous extension of, uh, of markets. Um, choices around, you know, what you will do, what are your products and services? How does digital um, transform some of those? Fundamentally, how will you win? You know, we have technologies in digital that allow for true customer centricity things that were not possible even five years ago. Um, one of the really foundational pieces of this thing we call digital is the opportunity for it to transform the money-making proposition. Where do revenues come from? What does that shift actually look like? Um, you have but to look at the automotive industry to see um, how foundational some of these choices are and will be in the future. I'm a huge fan of the automotive industry and have kind of been tracking Ford for a number of years. So you see on this slide, you know, Ford has really defined the purpose of the enterprise. You know, they're no longer in the business of making cars. They're in the business of transformation. You know, a huge choice to stop selling sedans um, and take those resources and redeploy them into other, quite frankly, um, products and services that are digital. In a massive move, taking their core product, the Ford F-150 truck, um, and, and making it electric, but, but going beyond thinking about you know, EVs and really looking at the software and services um, that can you know, be wrapped around um, that particular uh, vehicle. Um, and fundamentally thinking that the way in which they may win now and into the future is not so much even thinking just about the core vehicle part of the business, but really looking at new products and opportunities, you know, in and around uh, innovation. So what we're really talking about with the Fords of the world um, is no longer tinkering at the edge. We're talking about what we refer to as the big S strategy shifts. So getting to the core of what the business is all about and asking some critical questions, you know, with digitization or with a whole raft of other technologies, how does that really transform the fabric of the organization? What we would certainly argue, as you look at some of the stats in that intro video, is that many firms are stuck one level down. They're tinkering at the edges. They're looking at processes and they're missing the point that the opportunity here is much bigger. Um, and we will talk a little bit later about this sort of foundational shift in mindset. 
But one of the keys here is that both the big curve shift and those little curves, they matter. One without the other does not success uh, make. So let's look at uh, in a bit more detail about some of these foundational game changer elements. Um, and uh, just some food for thought here. And I'm really excited to hear from Tolu about what's happening uh, at Sportsnet. So the, the technologies, as I mentioned before, allow for true customer centricity. Any of you who've been watching any of the streaming services, the Netflix of the world, you know, they auto load the next episode. If you're binge watching, they have a recommendation engine based on your, um, you know, what you've been watching. Uh, and they're even experimenting with things like socks that have sensors embedded in them. So if you doze off while you're watching a show, they will literally pause that based on how you're moving around. Another big game changer here is rethinking every product um, and going beyond the actual physical entity and thinking about what is the service aspect of that. You see a picture here of a huge excavator, you know, the caterpillars of the world, loaded up with sensors now, connected to an app for a site manager at a construction site or a mining site, actually looking at how to manage and optimize the use of those devices, doing, you know, preventive maintenance. It just goes on and on. Another big game changer um, with this move to digital um, is the opportunity to no longer think about responding to the market, but actually managing the market. Um, one of my kids and his family are off to Disney. Uh, and uh, for those of you who may have been there recently, you know, you get a, a wristband um, that tracks your movement on the property so that they can actively intervene if there's a lineup at one particular ride and, you know, Mickey or Minnie pops in front of you and sort of shifts you over to something else where the lineup is a little bit shorter. Um, game changer number four is the importance of platforms and being part of ecosystems. Um, and historically, we have thought of organizations as pipelines. You know, this is our stuff. You know, we must do it ourselves. Well, now being aligned um, with other organizations and partners in the network um, is something to be contemplated as a key element of success going forward. So we're not done with four game changers, there are more. Um, so this notion of these pipelines or vertical hierarchies are really moving us away um, to thinking much differently about what, what actually does an enterprise mean? You have but to look no further than the Ubers of the world um, where they are very dispersed across a number of different entities, you know, drivers and customers. So it's really about the network and less about this bricks and mortar organization. You know, the technology allows tremendous connectivity throughout a supply chain. So again, rather than reacting and sort of actively managing what is happening at a point in time. And I have a picture of a diamond there because I met an entrepreneur in a small town in India um, where it's sort of the capital of small diamond production. And this entrepreneur actually optimized what diamonds he was polishing based on the spot price in New York and doing that in real time. Um, two other kind of game changers, you know, data is everything. And you see many organizations launching products and services that actually don't make money, but they collect data because that data is valuable. And with that data, you use that to do a better job with customers or think about new products and services. And the last piece with respect to technology and back to sort of thinking about the, the, the friends and family around your enterprise, you know, it's very difficult for single entities to be able to afford all of this stuff. So, and, and actually make it happen and reinvest in kind of core systems at a, at a rate that is, um, that makes sense. So this agility and technology and process um, and having partners around you um, who can help is absolutely critical. You know, you look at Amazon and AWS, for example, why might you build that yourself? You wouldn't, you know, why, why not just leverage the resources of others? So these big S game changers um, have so much opportunity for organizations, but often the question is like, why bother? 
aren't we just a-okay today? We made our quarterly results, the analyst call went well. You know, that short-term thinking is incredibly problematic because all you do is quietly refine yourself into oblivion. So the challenge for many organizations is one of two things, outright survival and making it through this incredibly disruptive moment in time, but more fundamentally creating advantage. And what you see on this slide is a, a news release, you know, from the New York Times that now, and 2018 was the inflection point, now has more digital subscribers than in their core business of sort of print media. Um, so there are huge opportunities. Um, chance favors the prepared, but what we're really talking about here um, are some fundamental choices for leaders to make in this age of digitization. So talk, um, let's go to the next slide here and let us look at what some of these are. So how do you get there? And I'm gonna pass the baton to Catherine Broman in just a moment. So it takes guts, it takes understanding, it takes risk-taking. Um, it takes um, guts to actually contemplate those big S strategy changes. But here's the thing, you have one of two choices as an organization. You can lead the way and win because you are first and that advantage accrues systematically and very quickly these days. Or you can choose to follow. Nothing wrong with that. But choosing to follow means you need to be superb at execution. And that's what these two graphs indicate. And that is the fundamental choice for many organizations these days. So along the theme of how do you get there, let me turn things over to Catherine and um, over to you. Great, thanks Elspeth. And so um, many of you, if you've, you know, one of our alum would know me as, as this person who talks a lot about this concept of execution. And, um, and, and I think it, it relates to what Elspeth was talking about that those little S game changers, right? Is that, you know, too often we think about execution as tactics. It's like, okay, we make a strategy, we, we throw it into the organization and we basically say, you know, let the, the organization figure out how to do that. The challenge is, is this statistics quite telling when we think, I'm not sure we know how to do that because to digitalize or to actually move through this transformation process, some of the ways that we've been managing technology are letting us down. And so there's sort of a new set of practices that we need to think about um, because this technology has become so fused within everything we do. And so, you know, not only do we need to think about strategy, but we need to think about really what allows us to execute on those goals, you know, on the work that, that will help us deliver to those goals. And so that's what I'm going to spend some time talking about. And the one thing I want to focus on is this problem number two, which is that digital can't be stuck in a silo. So I've done a lot of work around um, these digital transformations, and many people will think about if I just put in a digital lab or if I just I identify a digital senior leader, that that's going to fix my, my challenge and allow me to transform the organization. And, and that's really problematic because digital is the perspective that all leaders need to understand to rethink their business. So even if you're going to set the, the charge onto a single part of your organization or a single leader, the whole idea is everybody needs to, to jump on board with this and really rethink and not resist right, what it means for their part of the organization. So no nobody in the organization gets a, you know, a sort of a, a free ticket to ignore digital because it's transforming everything we do. And, um, and so whether you're managing internal processes and continuous improvement employees, employees work differently today. We all know that out of COVID, right? How are we going to transform the workforce? And, and then you think about, you know, functions of the organization that are more external, you know, how do our customers want to interact with us? And so it's really problematic to think about this as something we can assign or delegate because digital is something that all leaders need to execute on. And I'll go back to Elspeth's um, automotive story because I, I think it, it comes down to the complexity of this and why technology processes are letting us down a little bit is this idea, and I'll share a story of um, what happened to my daughter and I Sunday. We were taking a drive, you know, from, from sort of Belleville area to Kitchener, and I drive a, um, a, a Volvo Recharge, so a fully electric Volvo Recharge. And, um, and so we got stuck. We got stuck in Toronto. Um, my battery, you know, is cold, and so I'm like, you know, I got let down with regard to not being able to find an EV charger that could actually give me the charge. So, you know, we, we did visit 
you know, the, the Petro has these EV chargers and neither of them worked. And then I went to the flow stations and, and I didn't have the card I needed to do that. And so my daughter and I ended up spending the night in Etobicoke and, uh, because I couldn't charge my car. And so I want to go back to the beginning. So my husband drives a Tesla. I made the decision to buy this EV vehicle a few months ago. And when I was sitting at the product level, they looked the same. Like I was like, oh, I like Volvo. I like the car, I like the way the car feels. And so at the same level, you know, they're both electric vehicles. They've both done a very good job of giving the, the driver an experience that has, you know, an electric option, fully electric option. But then I got my app from my Volvo Recharge. And, you know, my husband's app is awesome. Like he can, the car tells it when people are near it. If you drive a Tesla, it's like, it's amazing, the app. My app, you know, I have trouble connecting to my car. Oftentimes there's, you know, updates are delayed. So at the software level, I'm, I'm feeling a little let down. You know, um, I, I feel like there's just not a lot of energy, you know, being put into developing this as a, a software experience for me. So my app lets me down is my point. But I think the biggest thing that let me down was the fact that I couldn't charge my car. And, you know, Tesla had the foresight to think this through. You know, they, they laid the infrastructure. They thought about the system that they were transforming before they put a, a car on the road. Whereas I feel like, you know, the other people that are playing in this EV space, you know, kind of delegate that to other people. It's like even the salespeople, when I bought my Volvo, they're like, no, 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 there's great, you know, ChargePoint and all these other companies, they won't let you down. But then when I call and say they let me down, they're like, yeah, that's not us. That's that's them. And so the whole idea of convergence is great for Tesla when they can own the whole thing. But I think for other companies that can't own the whole thing or trying to figure out how to work collectively, this digital transformation concept becomes a lot more challenging. And so as a digital leader, you know, leading through the product development, leading through the software development, those are certainly key parts, but leading through the ecosystem change leading through the partnerships and figuring out how people are going to work together, that's convergence. And that is where you really need muscle. Uh, whether you're changing internal processes because you're sort of transforming the way people work within your own organization, or you're actually transforming, you know, ecosystems. And this is where the muscle to lead through this becomes really important. And so the muscle is what I want to focus on. And I called these five little S game changers because I like little S. Like if you know me, I'm always like, I'm, I'm willing to execute. You know, I'm like, let's get this, figure out how to get this done. And so I also get really, you know, triggered when people are like, what's the, what are the tactics? Because I'm like, this isn't tactics. This is leadership. This leader, you have to lead through transformation. You can't delegate it to tactics. And so five things I want to focus on. The first one is to enhance critical thinking. And so many of you have probably been tinkering in design thinking, the whole idea of like putting your customers first, putting them at the core, definitely an important part of this, you know, definitely a game changer. But what I want to call your attention to is this thing called systems thinking. And it's because we're transforming, we have to understand the system we're transforming. And so when Elspeth was talking about all those things, market, platforms, um, leveraging networks and connectivity, those things are the system. Right. And so understanding the system, and it's not always a process, by the way, it, you know, it could be a broader sort of ecosystem of moving parts. It's complex. So systems thinking is another major critical thinking requirement for these digital leaders. Then I want to talk a bit about reframing product management to digital product management, because I think the muscle that we're looking for is sits in organizations right now as a product management capability. You know, people that have been managing products and carrying P&Ls and having to show that these products are generating benefit and value for an organization. But the challenge is pro all products are becoming digital products. And so whether you're, you know, anything that you do can be connected, whether you're selling cookies or you're selling tractors, it's all kind of this analytics and connectivity is all changing the way you think about your product. So digital product management is a new sort of management capability that's evolving as part of this muscle. Data analytics and artificial intelligence, absolutely. Like that's the whole core to me, the whole digitalized, the digitization concept is what feeds this ability for everything to be smart and informed and information to get where it needs to be at the right time. And then finally, flexible and agile technology practices, Elspeth already talked about, but that part of the technology organization, I think they've got some made some great headway. Many technology organizations are working with agility, 
really understanding that. And that's where the technology organization can really come and, and play a major part. And then finally, I think the biggest thing is senior leaders that aren't afraid of it. Right. So, so many times I just see people thinking tells this point, like, oh, my God, this needs to go away. And I'm sorry to say, but COVID-19 has just accelerated this. Right. So the whole idea that technology is not going to transform my business, you know, you're a special unicorn that can avoid the digital age is that whole question of like, you know, that that there's a lot of fear and a lot of resistance as to what these new business models look like. And then having the muscle because going through those uh, barriers organizational barriers are tough. And so it's having that muscle to be able to lead through it. But if you do it, the benefits are significant. And so, you know, one, one benefit is stop falling victim to the hype, right? So it, amazingly, a lot of the things, and Tolu's going to tell us about this, not that I'm, you know, minimizing his job to being simple, but I think it's like you can't buy these things. You can't buy this capability. You have to build it. And you can build it with a lot of things you probably already have. And so again, stop falling victim to going out and purchasing this capability from some technology vendor, right? Like the whole, we have to get, really try to understand this at a deeper level to, to build these solutions internally and leverage what we already have. That will allow you to get a better uh, return on your technology investments. So really making use of what you have as opposed to buying anything that new. And the last one is that people, when you match people, with the right technology or with the right digital products and services, we're starting to see that we can start to get at these, so what we call the 3BL, the triple bottom line, right? We're starting to have more inclusive work practices. We're starting to really understand the impacts of sustainability and environmental you know, impacts of what we're doing. But a lot of these digital opportunities coming through, you know, knowing more information and connecting and making things more efficient, we're starting to really think about, you know, this, this opportunity to think about profit people and planet. You know, if you've never been taken down by social media, that, that that's the biggest thing about people, right? Is that social media is basically, if, if consumers don't like something, they're going to go to social media and tell you. And so that's that a great example of how, you know, digitize, digi digitalizing your business processes allow you to be much more in touch with kind of how people are thinking about your business and the impact you're having on the planet. So how do you get there? Three things for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tolu. One is we got to stop blaming IT. This is not their job, right? Digitalizing your organization is not something you can assign to the IT organization. They have done a heck of a job. And I don't know about your organization, but our IT organization here at Smith, they put us remote. We were up and running. You know, after COVID, there was like a flip. Like they are doing their job. The second thing is investing in infrastructure and digital skills, technology, partnerships, people, digital skills are essential and being sure that we're making use of what we already have. And lastly, we need a connective tissue. So as much as we've always talked about the importance of bridging technology to the business, we still embed everything we do in this notion of an IT project. And that IT project artifact needs to be challenged right? Because again, I, the IT project is what our technology organization is doing. The ability to take that technology capability and drive benefit and value from it is more of a digital product management practice. And so we have to be rethink the connective tissue between these two organizations. And then lastly, we need to build a corporate muscle to do that, that actually goes across business silos. So again, if you've had I've taught you, you probably heard me talk about ventilating, right? Ventilating the silos. It's the whole idea that we need to keep the silos, right? But we need to figure out how to, you know, get them working better together and inform each other. And that's a real horizontal uh, business capability that organizations, you know, really are not very good at um, because we're used to really working within our verticals. And so that's the end of me. And what I'm going to do now is stop sharing my screen. And um, and we can then turn it over to Tolu. Oh, and just just uh, I'm sorry no here. <laughs> no problem. I can start sharing until you stop. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, there we go. Thank you, thank you, there Jason. Awesome. All right.
All right, so I'll just give Tolu a quick introduction. So Tolu came, he is a digital product manager at Sportsnet. And sorry, I, I lost my way there because I couldn't stop sharing. But um, <laughs> but so Tolu and I met in, um, in when he did his MBA with us. And he was one of those students that just really said to me, Catherine, do you know what you're actually teaching? I'm like, I'm not really quite sure that I know what I'm doing. And that was a few years back. <laughs> so now it's we're good. We're happy to say that we've come together. We're sort of really understanding this digital product management concept. And so he's going to tell us a bit of what, what's going on at Sportsnet. Awesome. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be sharing today around streaming at Sportsnet. Just FYI, if you see the microphone is in part because I work for a broadcaster, can't really work for a broadcaster and don't have the setup. So uh, it makes streaming more fun when you're actually getting to live it as much as building the stuff. Okay, so today I'm going to be walking you quickly through um, essentially the digital playbook that we go by on a basic level and um, to match up with everything you've heard about from Catherine and Dr. Murray, I'm going to walk you through how we do streaming at Sportsnet and the transformation around that, some benefits and my own personal anecdotes as I've gone through it. So generally, um, we've got to define that problem right at Sportsnet. Typically, um, at Sportsnet, we use cable TV to broadcast all sports that you watch. So if you have a cable connection, you can just turn on your TV, you can watch Sportsnet now, Sportsnet 1, where specific, all kinds of things are all available. Um, the other side to this, which we'll get to in the constraints a little bit, is as you can imagine, because we're a broadcaster, there are so many different parts of the org. So you've got to align everyone around this idea that not only are we going to broadcast on cable, we've got to get streaming. So everyone has to be on the same page. I'm talking your broadcast team, your editorial team, marketing, sales, your, obviously your product management team as well, but any other interface across the organization has to be on the same page. The solution that we plan, there is a different aspect for every piece of that organization to have a, a part to play in that solution. So if you think about it in the terms that we just heard today, the biggest is the entire strategy around becoming digital from a streaming perspective. And then of course, the little S is what are the tactics that each team is going to employ. I'll walk you through my part of this as well. And then we'll understand and bring this up and tie it all together. And then finally, you got to understand constraints. Even though we are going to an online streaming platform, we do have broadcast rights. And again, I'll walk you through it on the next slide that we have to um, worry about and navigate through. You cannot break those constraints because there are licenses, there are fees that you're going to pay to do that. So um, you have to figure that out. And then finally, in building your tech, uh, you've got to think about, is the solution a hammer or a screw? So if you think about having a screw and you want to put it in the wall, sure, you can hammer it in, but if there are already grooves, maybe a screwdriver would have been a much better way to solve that problem. And then finally, no plan survives reality. Um, you know, as you can imagine, you think you have the best ideas. How do you navigate through that? And how do you measure success? What's working, what's not? How do you adjust? So let's start with that streaming initiative across Rogers Sports and Media. So uh, if you have Rogers at all in any way, shape or form, phone, wireless, what have you, we do have a cable TV section. And within that, the Sportsnet studios that broadcast this all needed to change. Why? Well, one of them was, of, of course, COVID. But also, as that aside, everything that was considered streaming sports was also going online. So we did have to rethink, how do we broadcast the content? How do we get in places where there are restrictions? You can have as many people. And how do you then also introduce an all new streaming experience that doesn't reduce the sports experience, but in fact increases it. And then of course, cable, as we all know, is plateauing. I'm not going to say dying because I don't think it's particularly dying. I just think it's plateauing in the state it exists. It now needs to transform in another way to acquire more growth. So how do we also keep one, the cable customers we have and maintain that business. As I talked about, we are a part of Rogers. So we have to think about that part of the business as we build this streaming platform. So we have to keep those guys happy and then add on top. Then we look at now the brand experience of this. How do you en engage with Sportsnet? So we have to be from a brand language, fun, approachable, and importantly, available. And then the iconography of this, so the logos, the colors, the animations, what you see, they have to be consistent. What you see on TV should match up to what you see on, for example, the laptop or the iPhone or, you know, your iPad or your devices. And then I talked a little bit about that constraint piece earlier. So we do have a partnership with the NHL and that is our biggest partner in terms of leagues. And so we have to think about all the teams underneath that within Canada. There are three levels of the partnership. There is the regional level, there is the national level and the global level. 
all of them with all different constraints. And so we have to think about that as we build out this um, system. And Catherine talks about it briefly where, you know, it's not enough that you work on the product at the top. The system underneath that you are working on is also important. So this is one of those areas I wanted to highlight where we have to think about when you purchase an SNL subscription, we have to then almost place you at a tier so that we can go around that constraint, which is very interesting. In terms of the Blue Jays, which is, of, of course, an MLB, uh, you know, partnership, we own the Blue Jays as Rogers, so we do get the exclusive ownership of all their games, except a few, which we then have to sell onto YouTube, in part because of um, a constraint that we agreed with the MLB. And in WWE, do have the exclusive partnership as well, and that in itself, as a price system, is separate from all these. Now, how do you ensure that this is all not so confusing? Of course, we, we do our best to make it as straightforward as possible, but in building out the system, so you understand that it's not just as straightforward as, oh yeah, just build a website, put some streaming on it, it's like Netflix, it makes sense. It's not always that straightforward. Then finally, in terms of the little s, now, whenever you introduce a streaming platform, as a customer, I don't particularly care about all these constraints. You know, it sucks to be you, but all I want is when I pay for it and I use my mobile device, it's got to work the same as on my PlayStation 5. It's got to work the same as on my computer or my smart TV. Anywhere I see Sportsnet, I just want to be able to watch it. So as you can imagine, all those different things also, again, in each little tactic you have to think about now. Um, and then the final thing, of course, in terms of all these different agnostic devices, it's got to be available for a cable user because you already get Sportsnet through cable. If you have a direct relationship with us through SNL, which is our direct streaming platform, we also have to prepare for you in that way as well. And then this is where I start to think about things specifically mobile. In any app on your mobile device, you have in-app purchases. And this type of relationship is slightly different than the other two. In the other two, we, we maintain a relationship with you some way, somehow. But through the in-app purchases, your relationship is actually with your device manufacturer. So if you come through iOS, it's actually, your relation is actually with Apple who allows us to stream that game to you. And so at the end of the day, it's another relationship that we now have to think about and how do we manage those users and essentially improve your experience. So this is where the fun part comes in. My job and my everyday life that I enjoy and I love so much. So I am meant to maximize your sports enjoyment experience. Um, if you think about that, the devices that I have to think about in terms of the experiences on iOS, iPhone, iPad, and Apple TV, even though technically it's not a mobile device, it still is because that's kind of what I think about. On Android, again, phones, tablets, and Android TV. So if you think about all those things, the form factors, the screen sizes, you have to find a way to make all those experiences maximize the potential of the device. Very, very different in each one that you think about and how, you know, for example, you Think about maybe iOS has a restriction that Android doesn't. How do you navigate to an, an iOS? How do you navigate on Android? And as well as and differentiating both platforms, you then have to find a way to be consistent above all. Remember, I talked about it already at the beginning. If I have a family plan, for example, um, if I have an Android, my partner has an iOS, or someone else, one of the children has an iPad, if we're watching sports across all of them, they've got to remain the same. So thinking about all those different pieces is key. So finally, now let's get into some pathways to streaming in terms of, again, what we think about and how we show up as Sportsnet. So on the left side, you're looking at what it's like on cable. Any cable partner that comes into Canada comes immediately into our thinking. So if you have cable through Rogers, Shaw, Telus, Bell, Kojiko, anybody else, literally we provide as many that are available in Canada that have Sportsnet. In part one, I already talked about it. Our organization has people on the cable side that are vested in ensuring that their business grows. And so we are supporting them in that way. Anytime a new partner comes aboard, of course, they're going to tell us, okay, well, if you're going to bring uh, Sportsnet onto our cable platform, we won't also be available on your streaming platform. So that is now a negotiation tactic again that we've now also introduced for cable. SN Now, this is now our dedicated streaming. You only want to watch sports as you prefer. You can come in, create your own account, sign in as much as you like, use it as much as you like, and that is a straightforward experience. You don't have anything else. We don't think about, you know, all the other pieces of the business. This is a one-to-one -one relationship with you. We can easily here get your favorites, serve you quickly with sports that we know you like and love. Um, we can quickly get you things around the players that you like and love. 
it's a much easier pack of all the three that are here this is the easiest and this is the one that gives me the most joy because i'm like who don't have to worry about hoops and jumping around rights and things like that much easier and the cool part of this too you can actually watch this anywhere in the world through sportsnet now so that's kind of cool and we can always avoid a bunch of uh, regulations in terms of your localized place because of sn now so that's kind of nice now the final piece of this is now the in-app purchase. So I already talked about it briefly where we don't have a direct relationship with you. We have a relationship with your vendor or I should say Apple in this case. You have a relationship with Apple and then we stream it to you through Apple. So imagine a scenario where um, you signed up for monthly, okay? And you wanted to call into Sportsnet and say, hey, I have an issue. How do we resolve those kinds of things? That becomes very tricky because we do not technically know anything about you unless you link your purchase to an SN Now account. The moment you do that, now we know more about you. It's easier for us to debug and solve things. But again, this is in part because of privacy, which is also another constraint that we have to work around. So keeping your data private, not knowing as much about you, and for a number of people who are worried about you know, privacy and what have you, it's not that straightforward. Devices do in fact hide your information from providers on the backside. So that's kind of cool as well in terms of things we think about and introducing this all new streaming platform and improving sportsness experience. Now, one of the other little essays that um, we talked about um, previously is getting you quicker into the game. So if you get the mobile app today, which I encourage you to download, by the way, just got to plug that in, uh, Sportsnet, anywhere you have any of your app devices, please go in there and download it. But if you come into the app today, um, the first experience you will hit is the news feed. So this is where our editorial team serves you all the latest that have happened in the world of sports, um, what is happening currently, um, what is going on live, any other updates that are happening in the game. You can also check your scores, highlights, things like that. So one of the things we, th we, we thought about was, can we get you quicker into the game through the news feed? And this is a small little product here. So in this part, if you only want to check out the news on the game as it's happening live, you can click into that massive image, the Oilers versus the Kings in this example, and it would give you literally the game as it's happening. We have another piece of, of a product called Life Tracker where literally will tell you the highlights of the game written. So say you can't watch the game for whatever reason, and you just want to follow the game just by the highlights or text. Life Tracker is available, has a fun animation and what have you. But if you want to watch it, now we've reduced the amount of taps it takes you to start the game. So right from the homepage, hit watch live. And this is in part because we know what your favorites are. You hit watch live and all of a sudden you're able to watch the game right from the homepage. If you then wanted to go to a dedicated streaming experience where you wanted to see everything else but the game today, we then have a dedicated streaming tab in the app where you could look for a game today's game because that's what we know based on your favorite that you want to watch. In this case, the Edmonton Oilers. And then you could go inside and pick maybe, for example, I want to watch Tim and Friends. You could then, within the SNL experience, search for that. And that would then be another tactic where we can provide you more content that we have at Sportsnet. And now, all of this that we did in terms of all these features you're looking at, we did a lot of to get ready for the new NHL season. All new sports studios, all new streaming app. Um, all these different pieces, we had to get ready for the NHL season that just happened. So this was a very, very recent uh, improvement that we did across the app, across the studios, across our marketing team, our marketing team in terms of, you know, the look and feel of all this, our designers as well, and getting this all ramped up across multiple devices. My own part was only on the mobile apps, but there was also another team that was working again specifically for the website, for gaming consoles, all these different teams coming together to make this all happen. And so what does that end up becoming like and maybe some takeaways from this presentation? First of all, the NHL is a fun, fun experience. Um, I, for, for one, seeing the backside of what it's like to get ready for an NHL season, it is a lot of work. It is great to watch and enjoy, but you learn a lot by seeing this. The other side to this is, and I want to quickly mention, sports will happen. Whether you are there or not, the game is going to happen. So you might as well, first of all, show up and be ready. All right, so showing up is step number one, but then competing with everybody else in our space is then the next step. So how do we show up in a way that is better than everybody else across the board? So that is a fun takeaway and you just realize it is very vital that you make deadlines, you organize teams, you lead leaders as much as you can to quickly get to a deadline. The other side of this then was now, 
with all these changes we made, the in-app purchase grew around 199%, which was fantastic across our, we hadn't seen growth like that since we launched this initially, but this was an improvement on top of what we had done before. And so thankfully all the tactics we employed um, essentially bore, bore fruit. In terms of how many users across all our mobile devices, we have over 700K across both Android, iOS, um, that use our mobile devices every month. So that's kind of cool to see, and it's still growing year over year. Um, in terms of other, other lessons that I learned, of course, comfort zones exist for both people as well as organizations. If we know what we know in traditional space of cable broadcasting, that is cool. But taking that next step isn't as easy. It's scary at first, okay? You will discover challenges because you are, you know, figuring out what's what. We've never experienced this kind of thing before. How do we, for example, figure out if you are in Calgary to figure out your restrictions or if you're outside Canada, what restrictions do you have? Those things will come up that you've never had to plan for before because on the cable, it just automatically picks up where you are and stops it for you. On a mobile device, now you can be anywhere in the world. Now we have to figure out all those different things separately. And then at the end, when you look back uh, on a day like today, it will feel purposeful. There was a good reason why we did it. We're happy we've done it. And there's still more to go. So now everyone in our organization is much more accepting of these kinds of changes. And then finally, of course, the organization will change. Once you start a digital transformation, it will change. The organization you know today is not going to be the same as the one on the backside. There's going to be new organizations. There's going to be new teams. There's going to be new things you need to support this change that you've made. And again, it goes back to tying it all in. It's not enough that the product at the top has changed. The software was also changed in the middle, but that system of everything you need to do to support your new changes, for example, having a social media team that's going to respond to people on social media is something we would never have thought was necessary, but those are things we do now. Employing a robust social media strategy Instagram, Twitter, TikTok is all new for us, and we're still figuring it out as we move along. But all in all, I do encourage you to take it on. It is going to be a fun, fun ride. Best case, you know, you learn a lot, but even in the middle, you are going to look back and be grateful you started on this journey. That is everything from me today. Thank you so much, and I will look forward to your questions in the Q&A section. Thanks, Tolu, and uh, welcome back, panelists. I have lots of great questions here and not a lot of time, so I'm just going to get to it. Um, a good question from Jeff McMullen, directed at you, Tolu, um, but also I'm going to invite our other panelists to weigh in as well. So um, can you please talk about the governance model you use at Sportsnet? What went well? What could have been better? Do any of the other panelists have thoughts on what kind of governance model works? Are traditional IT governance models helpful or not? Is that something you guys could address? Tolu, you want to speak to Sportsnet or does someone else want to give Tolu a chance to catch his breath and then we'll <laughs> let him get back to the Sportsnet example? I can take it if you want, Tolu, and then maybe you can follow up. So I think I'll, I'll chase down the, uh, do IT governance models work? I I would say um, no. <laughs> I think I think that the, the governance models I'm looking to, to organizations who are really trying to do this are more coming out of the product management governance model domain. So, so if you think about how you launch new product development, how you develop, you know, how you create new product improvements, I think those governance models would be effective. I'm also finding a lot helpful in like the R&D governance models, right? Because I think a lot of what we're doing is we're, we're really trying to think and ideate new ways of doing things. It's just so, you know, that, that whole idea of, of taking risk, for example, like IT governance models, to me, too many of them are risk averse, right? It's like you see something up front and you're like, you know, that the organization's likely to shut it down just because of the way IT governance often works. Whereas if you take a look at a risk governance model or a R&D governance, you're much more willing to accept that risk at the beginning and, and really have a lot more uncertainty. So, you know, I'm an IT person. So as much as I'd love to say, yes, IT governance models are the way, I, I just feel like our history of, of governing those um, is, are going to let us down. So, so that's where I'll start. And then maybe I'll, I'll see if Tolu has anything to offer. Certainly. Uh, let me, so the way we, we've now taken on that governance model is we've changed it a little bit. So we let IT handle a lot of risk pieces as to if we introduce this new tech, what risk does that introduce for us? We also have a security team that goes alongside IT that just figures out the cybersecurity side of it. But the rest of it in terms of providing direction is now solely at the product team. So 
we've now also started getting in more partners with our finance team just to look at, okay, let's ensure, because as a product team, generally, you don't think too much on the financial side of your decisions. So we've now pulled in our finance teams to re almost like regulate us and keep us in check on the product side to say, okay, if you're making these kinds of investments, this is what you're going to cost and this is the expected return. So that then helps us in making strategic decisions. And in a governance way, it's like you've outsourced the IT, the risk side of it to your IT team and let them only handle that. Everything else lives within the product team. And it's different because this is something that Sportsnet hasn't done at all um, in terms of providing direction, the tools we should use, the ways we should hire. How do we think about all the other teams that support these initiatives? Um, and it's different because nice product-led governance that we don't see popularly across Canada. So it's different for us now. Um, but that's kind of what we do. So it's a product-like governance model. IT only focuses now exclusively on the risk of it and staffing up all the product initiatives. Elspeth, if I could just weigh in too, because I was looking down the list of questions. <clears throat> um, I would also argue that many of these um, sorts of activities become pet projects and they get a certain amount of traction, but they don't actually get embedded again at that corporate strategy level. So um, I would certainly say from a governance perspective, this has got to be a big game changer for, for Sportsnet. So there must be corporate eyes, ears, pens, you name it on what you're doing. But the question later down is like, what's the bun fight between cable and streaming? And, and how does that get resolved in terms of investment resources? Because when we talk about this digital transformation thing, we're really talking about the cord cutting. Yeah, like cable, cable was... <laughs> I was going to say so yesterday. It isn't, um, but like it's that transition. So any comments on that, Tolu? Yes. So we've, so let, let me, let me tell you my own opinion and I'll tell you the corporate opinion. Okay. So my opinion is in general, as we move away from cable into streaming, we are going to become more global as a company. Hockey as we are almost like the ambassador of hockey in Canada at this point. And as we continue to go down this path, at some point, you're going to see sports nets around the world because anywhere hockey gets exported to, sports net needs to be there. And so that as a benefit is important that we figure out regardless of whatever is happening with cable. Cable may grow, it may not. I don't particularly think about that. I just think about growing sports through streaming as a primary strategy. Now, the corporate answer <laughs> instead is you know we think about our business as a whole uh wherever cable is wherever streaming is they need to live together and that's i think streaming has the ability to bring cable along i do i do see some benefit to that but that is essentially the corporate way we're going to try to pull them both in tandem as much as we can but i think generally we're going to lead with streaming and then have cable as a secondary option and so that's going to be kind of the benefits it breaks a bunch of barriers for us in terms of, I already talked about them, for example, regional issues, rights issues. I think that at that point, we can then start, re, you know, reselling the broadcast to things, teams like ESPN and things like that. And we become a primary leader alongside the NHL. And I think it's just a global strategy in general. So that's my thoughts on that answer. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bump over to this question about data. Uh, you talked about the central role of analytics and AI in digital transformation. For analytics and AI to create real value, the data needs to be there and to be of high quality. How can an organization make sure that digital products and strategies generate the data it needs to effectively capture users' experiences? And when do you need to start thinking about how data is captured? Who wants to take this one on? Okay, okay, Tolu's <laughs> unmiked and ready to go, and then Catherine. Yeah. Um, so you you think about feed. I, I don't want to just narrow it down to the data because I think too many times now we're using this data driven decision making as though that's the end all be all. The problem with data is also data interpretation. Um, so you have to capture feedback. Data is one part of it, and you do have to think about that for sure. But there's some things that don't show up in the data as well that you have to find a way to interpret and figure out without data. So yes, when you think about it from the outset, you've got to think about what is my feedback mechanism at the outset. I'm introducing this feature. Is it successful? Is it failing? You have to figure out what that feedback mechanism is going to be. It could be through surveys. It could be um, heat maps as to, okay, if I introduce this button here, how many people start tapping it? You could do things like how, what is the length of the session? 
those kinds of pieces of data tell you what is happening on your device. But the other side of data is also tell, your, the other side of data is what isn't in the data. And you have to find a way to capture that in some way, shape or form. So for example, if you're primarily a hockey led business, how do you figure out what people are looking for for basketball? Because if all you're focusing your data on is hockey, then you're also missing out on a bunch of things that are outside your perspective. So you've got to figure out whatever your feedback mechanism is and your data mechanism together, not just only the data side. So that's kind of what I say to that. Okay. And I might follow just um, goes back to what Elspeth said, you know, data is one of the big S game changers. Absolutely it is, you know, and I think to Tolu's point, but it's messy, you know, and it's, and it's not the only lever we can pull. So when you're doing digital product development, you, you, you pull from data for sure. The analytics has a major piece of that. But if you listen to Tolu, I would say he's pulling on mobility. He's pulling on mobility, the whole idea of what, what it offers that people walk around with a cell phone. Like he's saying, well, that's really important to me. So mobility is also a game changer. And then you look at social, like he talked about the whole idea that who knew we need to include our social, you know, who knew that we had to include TikTok and LinkedIn and that's another game changer. And then you look at all that's being offered in the cloud service space, right? This is allowing us to be able to say, we don't actually have to build this by ourselves. We can go out and look at what all these different cloud companies are offering us to be able to piece together these these fast solutions. So I think I, I'm with Elspeth 100%. Data is a game changer, but it's not the only game changer. And I think that it's just, I'm, I'm with Tolu too, there seems to be a fascination with it. And it's just like, if we just build our data organization, we'll succeed. But that data has to generate value. And, um, and so, you know, we have to be able to know how to connect the data capabilities of the organization to the rest of the company to really drive that value proposition. And maybe if I could just add in, because Catherine, you know, the data has to generate value eventually. And I think that is one of the struggles I see in many organizations is that you're investing in, um, you know, apps or whatever um, that's all about the data, but it may not be clear today or tomorrow or in the next quarter how you're going to monetize that. So, um, you know, I hesitate to sort of use the leap of faith, but it's having that longer term perspective. I was really fascinated to you by your comments. Like, you know, you dive into streaming and then you realize, holy moly, like we can go global. Like we've been Canadian. We've been Canadian hockey. And now it's like, oh, now, you know, the world is our oyster. So I, th I think, you know, uh, um, it's a bit about back to that kind of mindset shift, you know, Companies either get it or they don't. Um, and, and that is the fundamental, one of the fundamental problems that we're talking about. Thanks everyone. Uh, there are a lot of excellent questions and not a lot of time left. Uh, you were reading ahead on the questions Elspeth. Are there any that are you're burning, to, dying to answer? Cause otherwise I'm gonna throw, there's some, a couple of questions about managing the silos uh, issue that you were talking about earlier, Catherine. Um, here's one, which is, uh, as stated in the slide, strategy and the data analytics cannot be in silos. However, from the analytical maturity level where the organization still keeps it in silos, how do we initiate the strategy and tactics to break the walls and make the business stakeholders or leadership buy in? Yeah. So, so I would say, um, so just one, one point of clarification, I, I think we need the silos. <laughs> the silos need to stay because that's where all the good work happens. I think the biggest challenge we have is how to open those up. So again, me growing up in a farm community, we, we, we had this concept of you have to ventilate the, the grain silos or the silos will eventually blow up. And I think the whole idea that we're not good at is we don't know how to work across silos. So I would say my answer to that would be Google horizontal management, because there's a whole bunch of things that are coming out now about how to manage and lead on the horizontal. And, and the challenges with the senior leadership team is they own a vertical. So they're really in their vertical, right? So you have to get an appetite that goes across the organization. That's the really, really hard part is eventually you're going to have to translate to the vertical owner why they should care. And I think that happens like horizontal management happens at the middle layers of the organization often, right? And so it's the senior leaders that are always my biggest audience, right? I'm like, like getting them to really see the opportunities that lie um, on the horizontal within their vertical perspective, because that's really at the end of the day what they own. And if I could add, I think without the without some organizational construct, it's total chaos. 
Um, but here's another thing to throw on the table, and I want to go back to the cable versus streaming. At, the, at, at a certain point in time, it will be less about the product and it will be more about the customer. And so I think fundamentally what is happening here is this move from organizations that, that have been set up by product, products and moving towards thinking, as Catherine said, more horizontally and using the, the customer as the entry point for everything else that gets done. So, and I know we're running out of time. So back over to you, Meredith. We are, and I'm sorry, my puppy just decided to pick this moment to get very exuberant. Um, okay, so what I wanted to ask if there are any final closing, like a, like a, a 30 seconds, like anything you want people to take away from this. I've had to, my puppy is just barking her head off right now. I'm really sorry. So anyone, final thoughts before we go to the wrap? Um, I know there were a bunch of uh, questions in the in the audience. I'll do my best to you know discuss them maybe offline or whatever. You can reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, we can we really just have a chat about it. Um, my name is already right there, so feel free to reach out. Um, but excitingly, please join Sportsnet. Um, join us in this journey. Uh, download the app. <laughs> uh, download the app. You know, let me know your thoughts. I'm generally open to any ideas. There's so many different feedback mechanisms that we try to employ even in this digital transformation journey. Uh, but of course, hearing back from people that, you know, have heard me speak or heard about Sportsnet and have access to me, I'm always open to chat about it. So certainly looking forward to that conversation. Now, I might add one thing to Tolu's and I think Elspeth and I really wanted to just start a conversation. You know, I wish, I wish we could say we had all the answers. I wish we could say that this was going to be easy, but I honestly think transforming your organization to the digital age will be one of the most challenging leadership, you know, um, challenges that we're going to have. Like it, it's hard. We, we don't want to go there. We're, we're afraid of it. There's so much going on. And I think Elspeth and I, we just wanted to start the conversation. And that was really the intent of today. So to Tolu's point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an email away. I mean, you can't, you can't entertain me more by talking about this stuff. I'll give you 15 hours of my time if you let me. And I think Elspeth is the same. Like we're both, we're chewing on this. We're saying this feels different. This feels exciting, you know? Um, and so the conversation is a starter. It's not, it's not an end point. And that's how, um, that's how, what, what I would say, Meredith. And will we give Meredith a few minutes to just No, I'm, I'm here. Uh, a puppy I is would... the whole thing. Okay. Well, so speaking of you two and having the opportunity to mingle with both of you, I just want to uh, let our audience know, I always like to plug the Queen's Executive Education programs at the end of our webinars. So you two, Elspeth and Catherine, are go both going to be involved in some upcoming programs. So uh, we've got a slide, I think, for this. May 11th and 12th, Strategic Planning and Leading Change, which is a two-day program at Smith Toronto. Elspeth, I believe believe you're going to be leading that program. And then June 8th and 9th, we have a two-day program in Project Leadership at Smith Toronto, which Catherine, I understand you are going to be involved in. Um, so people can find out more about both of these programs by visiting smithqueens.com slash execed. You'll see the URL on your screen. And now the exciting news. I don't know, should I be the one doing the exciting news or should one of you guys be doing it? Um, Smith School of Business has been involved in the launch of a brand new master's program, the Master of Digital Project Management. This is a one-year program that brings business and technology together to train people to lead digital transformation across organizations. This program is a partnership between Smith School of Business and Queen's University's School of Computing. And another tie in with today's program with today's uh, webinar. Catherine, I understand you're going to be the director of this program. Do you want to do a quick hello and anything or? You know, I, I just think it's, um, so this has been a long time coming. It's been a mind share that I, I just, I, I have so many people to thank for getting clarity on this. My biggest thank you is to the Queen's School of Computing. So the School of Computing has come to the table. You know, we could never do this without them. There's a whole piece of computing that business doesn't understand that that much I know, and they have been extraordinary partners. Um, and as the sort of the first program that really brings a partner um, at Queens to a master's a professional master's program, we couldn't have picked a better partner. They I'm excited to work with them. Um, Nick Graham specifically is my partner in crime on this, and um, I just I'm really looking forward to you know our, our launch. So our first official class will inaugural class is September 22. And uh, you can take a look at our website. There's a media announcement today. And again, 
talking to me, I will give you every hour of the day to, to talk about this because it's just so exciting to see this actually, you know, come to this point. So thanks it's, to everybody involved. It's really exciting news. So again, as you mentioned, smithqueens.com slash MDPM for more information and classes start in September. I do want to let our audience know we will be back with a new webinar in March. Keep your eyes on your inbox for more information. Elspeth, Catherine, and Tolu, thank you so much. As always, we are so lucky to have so many gifted people in our community, and it's such a pleasure to get to hear from all of you. I'm sorry to our audience that we didn't get to all the questions, but so you go, you can only do so much in an hour. Um, thanks again to everyone who tuned in, and again to uh, Catherine, Elspeth, and Tolu. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Take care. <laughs>